We have all seen the amazing underwater scenes on TV from the likes of Blue Planet or National Geographic. In fact, the stunning visuals of fields of coral or pods of dolphins or baby turtles hatching on a beach is probably what got many of us interested in scuba diving and exploring the seas in the first place. But on this channel, if I filmed this, and only this in every episode, you would get as bored watching it as I would filming it. You and me both just want to see something that we've never seen before. And in order to find species that are much more unknown, we need to leave these stunning reefscapes and head to a dive site that is at first a lot less appealing to the eye. Now I know what you're thinking. Why have I taken you away from all that beauty and brought you to this seemingly barren landscape? Well, don't quick away now, because I promise you that by the end of this documentary, I will show you at least one new species that you've never seen before. I am Justin Carmack, and I want to welcome you to the world of muck diving. Hmm? Critter Hunter. There are many great dive sites around the Philippines, all with a great variety of marine biodiversity. But for this episode, let's head to the Western Visayas and check out the muck sites in a little place called Dawan. And to get us started, let's talk about the countless species of crustaceans to be found here. Skeleton shrimp are known for their slender bodies, which allow them to virtually disappear among the fine filaments of seaweed, hydroids and bryozoans. They are sometimes also known as ghost shrimps. Their bodies can be divided into three parts. The cephalon or head, the perion or thorax, and the abdomen. They spend their tiny existence clinging to hydroids or other substrate by grasping on with their grasping appendages called Periopods. Because of their minute statures and transparent bodies, you really have to look hard to see this species along the seafloor. But once you discover how many there are and how easy they can be missed, you soon realize that there's a whole new world waiting to be discovered, and you continue your search with new perspective. As you're combing the bottom looking for some new finds, the next critter you might run into might just be the hairy squat lobster. Although tiny as well, about the size of a US penny, these guys must seem huge to our skeleton shrimp friends. The pink hairy squat lobster is always found living on the side of barrel sponges with their near perfect coloration or camouflage to blend in perfectly with their habitat. The scientific name is Laria siagiani and as hard as that is to pronounce, its common name is confusing as well. Even though this guy looks like a shrimp, and is called a lobster, it's neither. This squat lobster is actually part of the family of crabs called anomorans, which are decopod crustaceans, meaning they have 10 legs. The Donald Duck shrimp was high on my list of critters I wanted to see in the wild, and when I finally found my first one, it was worth the wait. Sometimes called a crocodile shrimp, getting its name from that long rostrum nose, this commensal shrimp not only sports a unique look, but some bright purple legs to go with it. Although I have better luck finding these guys at night among a variety of rubble and coral habitats, I can't say that they are completely nocturnal 
as I see them quite a bit during the day as well. True nocturnal critters never come out during the daylight hours. Donald duck shrimp feed on algae, crustaceans, and zooplankton, and are also known to be cleaner shrimp. Sometimes if a diver holds his hand out real still, old Donald just can't help but to come over and start cleaning your fingers. The spiny tiger shrimp is a coveted crustacean species for divers, but because of its shy nature and their tiny size, most divers have probably never seen one for themselves. Hiding among sponges and other substrate, and at a maximum of 2 centimeters in length, you can imagine how they would be difficult to find. Although the Philognathia cerotophalma or spiny tiger shrimp, was first described in the early 1900s, there's surprisingly little information on the web about them. Their conservation status is unknown, which I guess isn't too surprising, being so hard to find in the wild. Harlequin shrimp are much larger than their tiger neighbors, but maybe even higher on the diver's bucket list. Although these critters are relatively rare and seen by few humans in the wild, it's their unique characteristics and color patterns that make it popular for underwater photographers. The most notable feature on this crustacean is those huge front claws. The claws are big and intimidating, but in relation to their size, the actual pinchers are comically small in comparison. Harlequin shrimp exclusively eat starfish, using those big arms to flip over their prey and eat them alive. A lesser known fact about these guys is that the color of their spots is determined by the color of the starfish they eat. This pink variation must munch on this color of sea star, while this guy must be chowing down on blue stars. Now as you can see, this shrimp is blue, but he's eating a piece of brown starfish. So why is that? After filming this guy and getting out of the water, I asked the same question. I found out that these shrimp unlike most, like to live in one burrow and can be found in the same spot for a long period of time. Because of this, the local Filipino guides know where to find them, and wanting to keep them fat and happy, they'll sometimes bring them a starfish snack when they visit. Shrimp are more vulnerable to predators when they wander out of the protection of their burrows to find food, so apparently keeping them safe and fed and in their homes is good for business so that these guides can tell the tourists that they know where to find their bucket list critter. A documentary about muck diving would not be complete without mentioning the mantis shrimp. And there's a large variety of mantis species around Darwin that we can talk about next. This golden mantis is maybe one of the biggest mantis species I've ever seen and definitely one of the most beautiful. Mantis shrimp sport some of the most fascinating and beautiful eyes in the entire animal kingdom, but they are not all the same shape. Some are round, some oblong, but the eyes on this golden are in a league of their own. Out here in the mucky bottoms, this pink-eared mantis shrimp makes an appearance, bobbing in and out of its burrow to see what's going on. In comparison to that golden mantis, this guy is quite small and much more common to see. Their burrows can be seen dotted along the bottoms of nearly every dive site along the coast here. As you can see here, their eyes are more of a globe shape, but just as crazy to look at. This is a tiger mantis who seems to be missing one eye. The fun thing about a tiger 
is that they come in many different color variations, some more common than others, but I've never seen one in this bright green before. One reason that the mantis is so difficult to film is because that they've been known to punch a photographer's lens so hard that it breaks. Undoubtedly, the most famous of all mantis shrimp is this peacock. Popular with both divers and in the aquarium trade because they are beautiful peacock-like colors, this species is very common here, always making an appearance at nearly any dive site. Although I almost always find mantis shrimp peeking out of their holes, you'll occasionally find them scurrying along the bottom, hunting for a meal. This guy wasn't very shy and let me get pretty close for a shot of those iconic eyes, this time in the globe shape again, similar to the pink ear. I got to follow him around for a while until it finally returned to the safety of its home. The ornate ghost pipefish is another one of those truly bizarre creatures you can find around Dowin, but you have to really look close. Their camouflage abilities are second to none, blending in perfectly with their habitat with both color and texture. A distant relative to seahorses, these guys have a few obvious differences, but also some lesser known differences as well. For example, in the seahorse world, it's the males who take the eggs in their pouch and give birth, but pipefishes like this one are a little more traditional, and it's the females who have the honor. Little is known about ornate ghosts, but one thing we do know is that after hatching as tiny larvae, they will float with the currents until finally finding their home as nearly developed ornates. However, as you can see here with this juvenile, they are still completely transparent until they finally settle in their new homes where they will quickly transform their color and texture to match. This guy will soon change into a beautiful, fully formed adult, ready to pair up and mate. As far as I know, there are seven different species of ghost pipefish, and this next pair are robust ghosts, also experts of camouflage. These guys perfectly resemble a floating piece of seagrass and can be even harder to spot in the ocean than their ornate ghost friends. It's worth having an expert spotter with you because finding a pair of robust for the first time is always a treat. Almost every time I spot a ghost pipefish, there's two together, always reluctant to leave each other's side. This pair was out in a field of seagrass that was a little more sun bleached and dead looking and their own colors exactly match that of dead blades of seagrass themselves. As in this case, males can be small of the two, and the females often recognized by their egg pouch. Just imagine being a predator and seeing this guy next to other blades of grass. You probably wouldn't even notice him. Even its eyes blend in and do not give it away. This delicate, slow swimming, and helpless species has only survived the ages by mastering the art of hiding. And it is awing to be able to witness that here in action. Earlier, we saw one robust that had transformed to mimic some green seagrass, and then another who mimicked dead brown grass. But here, it seems that a pair of each has found each other. 
The coloration and details is just amazing. You can even see what looks like bits of algae on its body or white spots that look exactly like bleaching on dying blades of grass. Even that long snout that resembles a seahorse, sporting textures and hair-like pieces on its skin, not unlike a leafy ghillie suit of an army sniper. This pipefish looks like a robust, but it's actually a rough snout ghost pipefish. Really, the only distinguishing feature from the robust are those hair-like appendages on its snout, mimicking different types of algae. Hey guys, if you like what you see in this documentary, come diving with me here in Darwin. I got a new dive center here. It's called the Critter Republic. The email is down below and I will see you there. Ghost pipe fish do not have a monopoly on superb camouflage abilities as proven here with this Ambon scorpion fish, which is common in the area. This is a species of marine ray fin fish belonging to the family scorpion fishes, which have a variety of different species. They are distributed all over the Indian and Pacific Oceans from the Red Sea to Tonga. We cannot talk about camouflage in the seas without featuring shrimp species as they have some of the most unique abilities in the animal kingdom. The saw blade shrimp, for example, has evolved the entire shape of its body to do its best to blend right in with the branches of a black coral that it spends its life on. Their colors can vary greatly, just like ghost pipe fishes and will depend on what color and patterns of habitat they choose to live on. As you can see, this guy does not resemble what we would call traditional shrimp, but he has no problem looking like just another branch in the corals. Someone with the same ability to morph color and patterns to match their host is the crinoid shrimp, who spend their life living on crinoids, also known as feathered sea stars. This is a close-up shot where you can see just how closely the shrimp matches the tiny arms of the crinoid he lives on. You really have to look close to find this species, but if you do find one, you're likely to find its mate nearby as well. What fascinates me is that there are unlimited color varieties when it comes to crinoids. They come in blacks and white striped and reds and yellows and everything in between. And for each and every variety, there's a crinoid shrimp that has morphed its color to match and spend its life hiding on its host. This is a pulsing Xenia soft coral, and if you look close among those polyps, you might just find one of these guys. Surely related to a crinoid shrimp, these tiny Xenia shrimp opt to live in the protection of this particular soft coral species with equally impressive camouflage skills. While well, searching the Xenia, you might also run into another resident, the Xenia crab. Just like their shrimpy neighbors, the Xenia crab does a good job not only keeping a Xenia host clean, 
but he'll protect it as well from any Xenia predators. As a thanks, the Xenia will keep him nice and hidden and away from predators more interested in a crab snack. If you aren't born with camouflage abilities, you better be smart. Kinda like this decorator crab. As you can see, this crab has stuck pieces of foliage to its body to make a suit that helps him blend in perfectly to his surroundings. He even gave himself a blade of grass for a hat and it can look quite funny seeing him walk around with it. This is a much bigger decorator and he's chosen to cover his bodies with bits of algae and fluff and pieces of sponge. If he stops moving, he becomes nearly impossible to discern from his surroundings. These odd shrimp not only adopted the colors of their host, a spiny sea urchin, but they also are brave enough to live among those sharp spines, which gives them double the protection. As you can imagine, with these guys riding along the spines of the urchin, these aren't the easiest to film. Oddly enough, the clingfish does the exact same thing, adapting the colors and patterns of its sea urchin home and using the spines for protection. This small shrimp forms a commensal relationship with various species of whip corals, which you can see him living on here. And from this comes some awesome hiding opportunities. Small already at a maximum of 15 millimeters in length, these guys have no problem snuggling right in and disappearing among the tiny polyps along the whip coral. These shrimp will spend their entire life on whip corals like these. So when you're lucky enough to find one of these shrimp, you're likely to find another. They will mate, lay eggs, and eventually die right here on this tiny whip coral, constantly swaying in the currents. As you can see from the Zanzibar whip coral variety, there are a number of different species that live here, all competing for this prime real estate. At the tiny 15 millimeters in length, nearly all divers will miss out on seeing these critters, not realizing that at a macro level, there's an entire new universe just waiting to be observed. These guys spend their entire existence here in the deep, completely unaware of the outside world and, by and large, with the outside world generally unaware of them. And this is what fascinates me about muck diving and the ocean in general, because there's so much to discover, so much to see and learn and witness firsthand, much of which we don't even know exists until we find it for ourselves. If you had doubts about the camouflage ability of this common scorpion fish, well, did you see that there's two here? Pretty good hiding technique they have, although since these guys have the protection of their toxic spines, I bet they're using that camo more for surprising their prey than anything. We've only talked about a tiny fraction of the species who sport amazing camouflage aspects, but for now, Let's move on to something a little different, but just as fascinating. I can assure you that these seemingly barren landscapes have as much variety of biodiversity as any rainforest in the Amazon. To prove that, just feet away I glimpsed this guy. A tiny octopus, about half the size of a golf ball, just peering at me from the muck. 
The interesting thing about the Matodi octopuses is that they possess the same cocktail of toxins as their cousin, the Blue Ring octopus. However, unlike the many spots of the Blue Ring, the Matodi only has two spots, one on each side of its head. To get a better look, I put a small mirror next to its den and waited for his curiosity to get the best of him. He couldn't help but to pop out and check himself out. It's always fascinating when you find out how tiny these creatures really are. Not 50 feet away, I ran into yet another octopus. Because of their amazing camouflage abilities, with them changing colors constantly, I at first thought that this was another Matodi. I followed him around with the camera for a while, hoping that he would eventually stop and let me film him, and he did. As I observed him on this rock, changing colors to blend in and hide, I soon realized that this was no Matodi, but a blue ring octopus. Octopus species can be extremely hard to identify, and although we know that this is a variety of blue ring, there are actually four different species of blue ring family, all looking very similar. After some research, the consensus is that this is a Hapalochelena fasciata, or the blue-lined octopus of the blue ring family. Everyone knows that blue ring octopuses are among the most venomous critters on the planet, and because of that, I am constantly asked if they are a danger to divers. And of course, I always say no, and any fears that a new diver might have of these beauties melts away when I explain that these dudes are about the size of a thimble and only use venom as a defense mechanism. As far as I know, no one has ever actually been attacked by a blue ring. In fact, most people will never even see one in person in the first place. If it is hard to imagine how small these octopuses are, it might help when you realize that this leaf that he's sitting on now is about the length of your pinky finger at its widest. Now that's small. Peeking out of a tiny hole, watching me swim by, is one of my absolute favorite critters in the seas, the Wonderpuss. Wonderpusses and mimic octopuses are a rare treat here in Darwin, showing up seasonally for a short time each year. When they do show up, local divers are a buzz clamoring to see one for themselves. Being a local here, I'm lucky enough to have been able to see many of them over the years, and it never gets old. This is a Mimic, which looks very similar to a Wonderpuss, with one big difference being that Mimics have this white line along their suction cups. It is rare for me to be able to film a Mimic or a Wonderpuss out of their burrows, but on this particular day, this Wonderpuss gave me a show. I guess he just wanted to show off his superb swimming skills for the camera. The Wonderpuss is a favorite of mine to be sure, but another one that is fun to film because of their funny behaviors is the Coconut Octopus. Now if this isn't the definition of an iconic muck diving site, then I don't know what is. Sometimes it is the most trashed, ugliest, muckiest landscapes where the most interesting critters call home. This coconut octopus was about the size of a tennis ball, but in comparison to the Matodi, Blue Ring, and Wonderpuss we just saw, it's huge. He was basically living in a mucky bottom area where the currents accumulate trash and sticks and coconut husks and all this junk makes for the perfect homes for critters like this. Here I wanted to show a size comparison with the golf ball, but he snatched it and ran.
For a critter that loves to hoard new toys, this guy must be in heaven. He's trying to keep his can, his ball, and his wine bottle. I'm not going to claim definitively that this is the most rare octopus species in Darwin, but even with hundreds of dives here, this is the one and only time I've ever come across the Starry Night Octopus. I do most of my critter hunts at night when some of the most interesting things come out, and it was no different with this guy. I discovered him in about 2 meters of water at the end of my dive and just followed him around through the sandy surge area. I noticed one thing right away. The shape of his head is unique, making him look like he's come straight from Area 51. On the very opposite end of the size spectrum, but still in the cephalopod family, was this tiny pygmy squid that's about the size of two grains of rice. How my expert critter spotter found this guy, I'll never know, but I was happy to see him. It's really hard to describe how tiny critters like this really are, but if it helps, Try to imagine tossing a fingernail clipping into the vast ocean and then go find it. If you hadn't noticed, this guy is hiding next to the same type of leaf or algae as that blue ring octopus was earlier. When I first arrived in the coral triangle, I had a list of critters that I wanted to film in the wild and the flamboyant cuttlefish was at the very top of that wish list. It's arguably one of the most unique, most incredible creatures in the entire world and a huge favorite for underwater videographers. Everything about the flamboyant fascinates me. The first thing you'll notice is that unlike other cuttlefish that swim around like a normal fish, this guy prefers to walk along the bottom on some really funny looking legs. He has two little bumps on either side of his rear that he uses like back feet and then he uses his two longest tentacles up front for walking. Just watch him here as he stalks around in the muck looking for a snack. As he sticks out his long tongue to catch a tiny shrimp, you'll also notice that iconic color changing ability that cephalopods share. I have found that when a flamboyant is in hunting mode, he transforms his color and texture to resemble the sands around him. He could also do a flashing or pulsing pattern on his skin that is thought to mesmerize its prey. When he's scared or startled, he might flash bright colors, warning prey that he might be poisonous or toxic to eat. How he is able to do all of this is a true marvel of science and nature. You can't really talk about diving and Dowan without mentioning frogfish. Even during the off season, where you don't see as many, they are still around. And there are many different species of frogfish, making it sort of a fun Easter egg hunt to find each kind. Frogfish can sometimes be quite hard to identify from one another. For example, this might be a painted frogfish, but even just this species comes in many different color varieties. 
They come in whites and oranges and purples and yellows and many more colors. So just hunting for each species isn't enough. You'll have fun finding multiple colorations of each as well. I want to give you the true scale of this baby frogfish here. So I put a golf ball next to him to use as a comparison. Pretty tiny, eh? This tiny clownfish is even tinier at about the size of a BB from an airsoft gun. As you can see by the grains of sand next to him. As you can imagine, using a camera the size of a brick to film a critter this tiny while floating in water with currents isn't the easiest task I've had all day, but I got him in the end. Perhaps the top frogfish species that divers want to see here is the hairy frogfish. They're pretty rare and only show up a month or two each year, but are a great attraction for photographers. Occasionally, a hairy frogfish will be bald not having grown its striations yet. But one thing that you could count on is that hairy frogfish have a distinct lure shaped like a worm as opposed to just a ball of fluff like other frogfish. The hairy frogfish, also known as the striated frogfish, is a fascinating and unusual creature that can be found in the tropical and subtropical waters around the world. As its name suggests, this fish is covered in numerous hair-like appendages, which help it blend in seamlessly into its surroundings and ambush unsuspecting prey. And here you can see we have come full circle as this little guy hunts and eats skeleton shrimp which we've seen at the very beginning of this documentary. It's an unconfirmed idea of mine that the skeleton shrimp season seems to be the same time as when we start seeing small frogfish. And as you will see with this guy, they seem to be the main course on the menu. I got to watch this tiny, beautiful Harry and he just sat back waiting for the shrimp to walk into range so he could get a bite. Talk about easy pickings. Nudibrink are a type of sea slug that are known for their striking and colorful appearance. These soft body creatures are often adorned with intricate patterns and textures, making them a favorite among underwater photographers and divers. Despite their small size, nudibranchs are incredibly diverse, with over 3,000 known species found around the world. There are hundreds of nudie species just in the Philippines, and I was always curious how many I could find in the Dawin area. For two years, I surveyed the waters here, documenting every nudibranch species I could find. When I published my first book on the subject, I was able to document around 260 separate species, 50% of which were undescribed and unnamed, and a couple possibly even undiscovered. Now I'm working on part two of the book, Nudibranchs of Dowin, and I'm already up to 350 different nudibranch species here. Do you remember the leaf or piece of algae that that blue ring was sitting on and where that pygmy squid was hiding under? Well, on those same leaves are these tiny little what we call leaf sheep. 
these are nudibranch and one of the most popular and interesting things you can find and one of their nicknames is Sean the Sheep Nudibranch. I think you can see the similarity. These things are awesome to find and make really good photography subjects, but the hard part is that they're nearly imperceptible to the naked eye, being about a third the size of a grain of rice. On the other end of the size spectrum is this nudibranch, which we like to call the dragon. It could be up to six inches long, although really skinny and narrow. And you can see these slithering around nearly every dive site around Darwin. The species has a really unique pattern and texture and shape of its body. I don't think there's any other species of nudibranch that has such a long snake-like body like this. Especially with all those serrata and weird patterns sticking off of its body. Living on stinging hydroids are these Eubranchus species, another really photogenic species of nudibranch, and an extremely difficult one to film considering its very, very tiny size, about the size of a nail clipping, and the fact that it's sitting on that branch of hydroid that is flapping in the breeze. Well, the currents, not the breeze, but you know what I mean. If you can find one of these, and if you can get a good shot, consider yourself lucky. They're not exactly rare here, but they are a hard thing to find and rewarding when you do. This tiny and colorful nudibranch is laying a ribbon of eggs on this rock. All nudibranch lay their eggs like this with thousands and thousands in a single ribbon. This guy is only about halfway through. So very similar and related to the nudibranch are these marine flatworms which you see all around Darwin as well. They're a little less common but there's a huge variety of them just like they are for nudibranch. So you can find countless species, colors, patterns, sizes of these guys making it just as exciting as it is doing a nudie hunt. This guy was much smaller, but as you can see, they don't try to blend in. They flash these abnormally bright and flamboyant colors to tell predators that they might be toxic to eat, even if they aren't. Because every dive I do here is a search for nudibranch species that I have never seen before, every time I get into the water, it's like an exciting treasure hunt, never knowing what I'm gonna see. This is probably what makes nudibranch so popular for divers and biologists. There are countless species to discover, each one a unique and flamboyant color or pattern, and never a disappointment. Take this fascinating Circe species, for example. 
Many nudie breaks are smaller than the period at the end of a sentence on a typewriter. But this guy is the size of a softball and looks like a transparent rose. How can nature be this diverse and amazing and strange? The ocean is a never-ending source of wonderment, that is for sure. In this documentary about the marine biodiversity of muck diving in Darwin, we have covered a ton of different critters. Yet, really, we have not even scratched the surface. The things that you can run into and experience face to face here would take many lifetimes to cover completely. And even when you think you've nearly seen it all, you find out that the critters that you've seen during the day are completely different than the night shift. While editing this documentary, it was actually a big task to decide which clips and critters not to use here. And I think that this is the story of Darwin. There are so many things to see on each and every dive that it makes Darwin a true jewel of the Philippines and the rest of the world. As for me, I will continue showing the world different and amazing species because as somebody once said, before somebody will want to save a species, first, they must love it. And before they can love something, they must know that it exists in the first place. <laughs>